Okay, so today I'm going to share with you the usage we are doing with Redis in our recently scaled architecture as part of uh, Bintray, uh, JFrog second biggest product and two of two. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm Ophir, uh, a proud member of the JFrog Swamp and I'm leading the Bintray development. A little bit about Bintray. So Bintray is a leading distribution uh, platform in the world. Uh, we support distribution of binaries, basically. Uh, we support distribution of Maven, Debian, RPM, Docker, Nougat, and a lot of other uh, binary uh, formats. Uh, basically, you can used to say that it's a little bit like GitHub for binaries, but we stopped to say that because it's, now it's much bigger than that. Uh, we use, fast, we use CDN for fast downloads, so our clients can download very, very fast their binaries. This is a, a huge advantage from our clients. And Bintway is spread around the world, which is a, cha a constant challenge to horizontally distributed. Some numbers. In Bintway, we served around 300,000 uh, software packages. Uh, and Last month, at least, we had 9,000 million downloads a month. Uh, if you do the math, you can see that each second we have more than hundreds of downloads. And each month, this number is almost uh, double itself. So our scaling is always a challenge. Our architecture needs to recently scale all the time. And, uh, and it's built to, to, to be like that. And Redis is naturally a key factor in that architecture. So some of the, cli the clients of uh, Bintway that causing these big numbers to go all the time, so this is part of our paying ca uh, customers. Uh, you can identify some of the names, but actually these are not the ones that create the majority of the load. Actually the open source clients, which ironically doesn't actually pay for the, software, for the service, create the majority of the load. Uh, so you can, you know, like Apache, Homebrew, or Android or Gradle, are using Bintway for distribution, and not a lot of people know that, but each time like you build something with Gradle, which basically every Android developer around the world you do, you actually hit Bintway because it's, fetch, it's going to JCenter, which is a Bintway repository, to get all the dependencies. Uh, naturally, there's a lot of Android developers around the world which makes a load <laughs> jump every month, and we are happy about it. This all leads to the conclusion that Basically, that big number is just our starting point. We can, Bintray cannot be down. Our entire architecture is built around that fact. If Bintray is even slow, you can monitor Bintray basically from Twitter. Every slow, small slowness generates a huge number of tweets, uh, usually not the nicest one. Uh, so we, don't, we, we basically don't allow it. We are constantly struggling that our kit to be, be before the load and to grow our architecture in a way that, will, uh, that the load will never surprise us. So our services, let's dive to the architecture a little bit. So we, basically we have four major components. We have the download server, which actually download the binaries, obviously carry the majority of the load. We have the web application, we have the REST API that allow automation of that entire process. And we have a lot of backend microser microservices, a lot of them uh, that do all kind of calculation and uh, outcome calculation of downloads or uploads, or all kind of uh, user interaction. If I, to be more graphical, this is basically the layout. We have the, all the, the services that uh, the client facing services, and then we have the microservices behind the scene, and we have the CDN that actually doing the actual download. So the layout looks something like that. We have UI and REST API served with uh, the MongoDB. We have the download server using CouchDB. Both of them can work one regardless of the other, so even if nothing fail, we'll still serve downloads and vice versa. And then we have the, all the backend services. The big question mark is what we have in the middle, uh, because this is synchronous, naturally, uh, to the user operation. This is async processes, and we were looking for something to, to, to work between them. The requirement from, uh, from that big question mark is, first of all, first of all no single point of failure. Uh, we can't allow that. Second of all, we need the true distribution. 
there's not much point to do to have uh, multiple uh, microservices if you don't distribute the load among them. Our use case, we need quiet period. The meaning of quiet period is like there's a lot of operations in the system that just need to build them together. So a single user operation, if it is like uploading six files, each one of them generate a kind of an index circulation. We prefer or we demand that these six will happen together. So we kind of wait on the first one until he finish all these operations and then start uh, the index circulation. So this is the quiet period. And we need, in some cases, data sharding, meaning all, we need a, a single microservice instance to take care of all the uh, uh, operation of a single user or other resource. Well, it, it won't come as a surprise that the solution we chose was Redis. <laughs> um, but Redis was not, it's just part of the solution, the major part, but it's not, by, it's not working by itself. We also select Twem, uh, Twem Proxy, also known as in the much nicer name, Nutcracker. Uh, basically, Twem Proxy is it's a net, it's a Twitter open source that is a, it's a proxy ab above Redis, or Memcache, if I remember correctly. Uh, and basically, it's a, it sits before the Redis uh, servers, and, uh, and the client sees it as a, a single thing, a Redis instance. Uh, some of the nice features uh, that it offers is, first of all, distribution between Redis, remote Redis instances. It offers sharding between Redis instances. And if, and in this case, this is this, is this one, if one of them fails, it just pulls it out of the cluster, which allows us to, to remove the, any single point of failure. And so this is basically our typical web, server, uh, web uh, flow. We have a service, usually a consumer-facing service. On the same machine, we have a twin proxy that is uh, installed on the same machine. That twin proxy proxies multiple remote Redis, uh, Redis database, which serves as the database of the microservice itself. And once a request is coming to the service, it's going to one of the Redis server. That microservice working with that Redis, doing its business logic with the um, backend database, MongoDB, or any other kind of uh, work it needs to do. And a lot of time, the outcome of that microservice is actually another microservice, which again is served from Twin Proxy to, to the remote Redis. If you'll take this slide and multiply it as in a production environment, you will see that there's no single point of failure. There's no one Redis cluster, there's no one Twin Proxy, or any single there's no single point of failure in any of this. This is multiplied thousands of times in our production environment and flexibly deployed. So we never get to a point that a single, uh, single failure will stop our production environment. Inside Redis, what that single Redis doing inside the, that the, the microservice is working with, and we actually, after the third microservice, we identified that we are doing it again and again and developed some framework we call Foreman that formalized that. We'll probably open source it one day in the future. So we have DB0, which is the inbound uh, database. One of the limitations of Twin Proxy is that it works only with a single database. Uh, so this, the remote uh, Twin Proxy put the data in a key, the, the payload in, the, in uh, DB0. Uh, the microservice take that data, constantly uh, monitor that DB with a Lua script, scan for the keys, and move it to DB1. In DB1, we have two keys representing each work. Uh, one is a Z set uh, sorted by the timestamp, which take care of the quiet period. That was a requirement a few slides before. And the other one is Ash with the data payload. Uh, each, uh, there's another uh, task that sits and, and monitor this DB with the command Z rage by score, take all the things that, in this example, the, the, that sits in the database for longer than five seconds, assuming that's the, the requirements for that service for the quiet period, take the data from here and move it to the last database, which is the working database. The, the work database, uh, naturally, the, the payload is still here, and it also has like uh, some data that is required for the working, like 
counting and recovery data. Our assumption is that that microservice can always fail due to network issue, machine collapse, just a bug in the software or anything. So we always have a recovery data. There's no place here that there's no state that is not recoverable. When the microservice is uh, coming back up after the theoretically crash, he knows how to take that recovery data and start and continue the work from that point. So we will never lose data and we will never uh, lose the state that we are on. Uh, this is a critical part of our system because a lot of the data that is, uh, that is passing is non-recoverable, like statistic, download statistics, or any kind of specific download uh, information cannot be recoverable. The operation already done. You have no way to do that without to persist it, persist it in, in the Redis database. So basically, this, every one of our microservices use that structure. Naturally, the payload is different from a, from a every operation. And, and this is how we formalize the, the work. Now, Bintray is, uh, is both serving is, is a Docker registry for our clients, but it's also provisioned in production using uh, Docker itself. Uh, and this, actually, when we started doing that a few months ago in production, we found out that it's, uh, it's a perfect fit for our use case. So basically, each one of our service pods, service pods is, is a Kubernetes uh, Docker uh, uh, term, which describe a, a, working a working unit, basically. So each one of our service pod contains a microservice, which is a container by itself. The Redis itself runs as a container and uh, the outbound twin proxy, which is also an, another container. These three containers together are a self-sustained uh, service pod that can provision using Kubernetes, and you can define the Kubernetes all the, like, how many instances of that service pod you want in production, and always have redundancy, and uh, how many you want in each time, uh, availability zone, time zone. Uh, we are multiple, uh, we run on multiple uh, cloud providers, so, you can define in tags how many cloud provide how many instances of that pod you want in each one of the provider, and the way it works from us because we are our cycle is very, is super short from development to production. Basically, our build, our grade build, build our software. At the end of the build, the outcome of the build, the CI server, is basically that microservice. It's, a, it's that Docker container. Sorry. Uh, so we, the, the grade build build the, the jar. We are Java Groovy base. And after it's built, the jar is also building the, the container. From that point, the, the deployment to, to staging is just uh, Docker uh, pull the container, and then to production, the same thing. So the cycle from development to production using Kubernetes and, uh, and Docker with uh, the service pod it can, it can happen in minutes. <clears throat> of course, that requires a lot of automation and uh, DevOps work, which we have. Luckily, we have. A uh, few of the things we learned uh, in the way, and that architecture is actually the outcome of uh, two, around two and a half years when that been to exist. Naturally, it didn't start that way. It's an evolutionary process, but this is where we are today. Uh, it just, a few things we learned on the way. So, naturally, we monitor everything in our production environment. And the majority of the monitoring tool we use, Logic Monitor, comes support Redis out of the box and monitor the number of keys out of the box. This is great until the first time you discover that you have very few keys, but you have thousands of uh, records on, the, on your list horizontally. <laughs> and then you figure out, only, only then you figure out you have a problem. After the first time you learn how to add to that monitoring tool, uh, monitoring to, to monitor the, the size of your list and not just the number of your keys in Redis. Um, the AOF file that was uh, mentioned here before is a, is a critical part of, the, of our Redis uh, infrastructure, naturally, because we assume that Redis by itself can, can, can stop working and, uh, and we need to persist that data. In our load, uh, we found out that if we we'll put it on the higher level of write to disk, which is always, red, in the load that we are hitting Redis, it, uh, it slowed Redis down, so we couldn't uh, sustain that. We actually t we set it up to one less than that, which is one minute, one second, I believe, you probably know better than me, and it's worked great. But you should really pay, 
be aware of that uh, settings because it has very big impact on Redis performance. Naturally, because it's hitting the disk. Even if when we replace the disk to SSDs, it didn't help us. We couldn't do it always. Um, there's no official packaging of Redis or Twin Proxy. I know some of us uh, consider that as a <laughs> as an advantage. Or what's the problem? Let's download it, uh, Redis and compile it or Twin Proxy. Our DevOps prefer not to do that, but. Uh, <laughs> We just do that for in ourselves in our own uh, artifactory environment and uh, uh, as a container, and then we have it. But it will be nice to have one. Um, as I said before, Twin Proxy only supports a single Redis DB. I know it's not considered such a limitation, but it's something to remember. It's, it drives a lot of the architecture that I described before. We found out the hard way that Redis can hold millions of keys without any impact on its performance. It's a good point for Redis. In our case, it was a almost a production disaster by the time we found out about it. Uh, our usage of uh, Redis is usually the payload is represented in protocol buffer. Uh, protocol buffer is a Google uh, open source uh, serialization, cross uh, language serialization. It works very well for us. It's serialized to string. It's very nice. I know you can do that using JSON or any other. Uh, string representation, protocol buffer works nice for us, so we're using it. We do have a single point of failure that we are aware of that, uh, which is Twin Proxy itself. If the Twin Proxy is down, the, 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 our services don't have anywhere to put their data to. And that's the, actually the only single point of failure that we have. We overcome it with a watchdog that makes sure that they're up and there's no persistence inside Twin Proxy. So that's not a problem, but it is something we are We'll probably take care of soon in the software level to have like a Redis backup for the Twin Proxy, a local Redis or something that will, will be there just in case Twin Proxy is, is gone or a second Twin Proxy, we're not sure yet. Uh, and Twin Proxy have a limited sharding support. It was good enough for us, but it is when an instance goes down and, uh, and instances do go down, Twin Proxy know by itself to move the sharding of uh, the single key sharding to a different instance. Once you bring that instance back up, it doesn't know how to move things. It will move things back, but then you will get the same shard on two different Redis remote server. If your system can't handle that, that can be a problem. 